Let's begin reading here in chapter 15 at verse uh, 33. We'll read to verse 35. I'll give you a basic introduction, and we'll move into our study. What we're looking at today is the way the Spirit is leading in ministry. We have two different examples of that. We'll see that in chapter 15 as well as chapter 16. So, beginning at verse 33, reading to verse 35, Luke writes, After they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and uh, preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And so as we've been looking at uh, the book of Acts, especially in our recent studies, we've noticed that Paul and Barnabas have been dealing with something that's a very serious threat to the church. And this was such a, an important subject because it, it related to the grace of God in salvation. You see, as we've seen already, there were Jewish people who were what would be called legalists who were adding works to the grace of God. They were teaching that circumcision and obeying the law of Moses was necessary in order for somebody to be saved. And what they were doing is they were undermining God's loving grace in salvation. Now, over the years of the history of the church, from the beginning of the church to today, there have been various doctrines that have been referred to as essentials of the faith. When, a, when you speak of something as being an essential, it simply means that it's something that is necessary to believe in order to be saved. So they would include things like the authority of Scripture, the Trinity, the virgin birth of Jesus, the deity of Christ, the incarnation, Jesus' bodily resurrection, and salvation through Jesus Christ alone. But one other doctrine that is absolutely necessary is salvation by faith through grace. Every major religion and every pseudo-Christian cult emphasizes one thing, and that is good works. And many teach that trying to live a moral life and doing good works will result in salvation. Well, Jesus taught us that the problem isn't found in, in uh, just doing bad things. The problem is our nature. By nature, we are, Paul would say, children of wrath. We have a fallen nature, and so doing something good doesn't necessarily mean that it's good enough. I shared this recently, perhaps even last week. I don't remember anymore. I'm old. But I do remember saying that you can dress up a monkey in a tuxedo, but it's still a monkey. So you can dress yourself up a human being. We, I, we can dress ourselves up in good works, but by nature, we are still enemies of God. So we need salvation. We need God's help. We need to be be forgiven. We need to be sought out. We need all of these things, and that's how God saved us. He saved us by the grace of God, by our faith in Him. And grace, when you see the word grace, simply means, and it's been defined this way in its simplest form, as a, it's an undeserved favor. It, it, it's something that we don't deserve, but by faith we receive. It's like what Paul said to the Romans in, in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 24, when he had said, we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Jesus. And so, because this is what is called an essential, it is something that Paul and Barnabas contended over with the legalistic teachers. Now, contending for the faith is actually commanded. We're not supposed to just agree with everybody and just let them go on their, their, their way to hell. We're, we're supposed to contend for the faith, especially when people will come with disagreement and say, oh, I don't believe that. So we contend. We're more than willing to engage them over the subject. Like it says in the book of Jude, in verse 3, where, where the writer said, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Contend earnestly. You are to, uh, with, with, with great uh, agony, agonize. It's, it's a Greek word uh, that actually we get the word agonize from. It, it speaks of a strong contention that we actually will, will put all of our heart and soul into contending for the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, this is taking place. People are entering in. They're beginning to command uh, Christians to be followers of the law of Moses and to receive circumcision. And, and so Paul, Barnabas, and others had gone to Jerusalem in order to get that issue resolved. And so while they were there, it was decided that Gentiles were not to be yoked with the law of Moses. 
The decision was made, as we saw last time, to exhort Gentiles to respect sensitivities of their Jewish brethren. Gentiles were not under the law, but they were to respect their Jewish brothers and sisters in the Lord and, and to do nothing to stumble them or to divide them. Well, Paul and Barnabas, Judas Barsabbas, and Silas were sent to Syrian Antioch, and, and they delivered this letter, and the church rejoiced over its encouragement, and that's what has taken place up to this point. And so at verse 33 here in chapter 15, it says, after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. And so they were sent, and uh, they were to... Uh, to uh, go and continue ministry, but notice that, uh, that, uh, that some left, but another remained. Notice in verse 34 that Silas remained, but Paul and Barnabas, and Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch. And what were they doing? They were, they were preaching the word and they were teaching the word. Now, when you're teaching and preaching, teaching and preaching are, are very similar, but not identical. Teaching is giving the essentials of what the word of God is saying. So, you are appealing to the mind of somebody. When I'm teaching the word as a minister, as I'm teaching the word, I'm saying these are the things that are taking place here. These are the essentials of what we're looking at. This is taking place in this way. This is why that was taking place. That's explanation. But when you're preaching, you're calling people to a decision. And normally, normally uh, preaching will be to those who are unsaved. So a teacher will say, for example, Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, he was born, he served and ministered, he eventually was betrayed, and he died on a cross, but he was resurrected. Those are essentials that you can speak of, but the preaching would say, why did he do that? Why did Jesus Christ incarnate? Why did Jesus Christ do the will of his Father? Why did Jesus Christ die on a cross? And did Jesus Christ remain on that cross? And so the preaching of the word of God would be to call a decision. Listen, if Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for man, and you are a human being, did he die for you? And if he died for you, what are you going to do about it? The Bible calls us to receive him as Lord and Savior, to turn from our sins and commit ourselves to him, to be born again by the Spirit of God. Now that's called preaching. So you're teaching the essentials by calling for a decision. And so while they were there, they were teaching so the body of Christ is learning, they're learning the things that they are to know, but he's also calling for unbelievers to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And they remained there for some time. It's estimated that they stayed for around a year doing that. Well, it says in verse 36, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord. See how they're doing. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had deserted or departed from them him in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And so what we see here is uh, a decision, as you see it in verse 36, where Paul says, let's go back. Let's visit those people in the churches and all. I want to do some follow-up. I want to make sure that they're doing well. You see, false teachers are beginning to undermine the gospel, and he wants to make sure that they're healthy, that they're being taught properly. And that's the heart of a shepherd, a concern for the well-being of the believers. And, and Paul was willing to endure anything in order to make sure they're okay. When I was in, bio, uh, in school, not even Bible college, in college, when I was in a college class taking comparative religions, one of the professors or the professor of, the, of that particular class was saying that Paul was simply a... Um, a, an intellectual, he, 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 didn't, he, he said, this, this teacher said, that Paul didn't have a, a compassionate heart. Now, he was not a, a believer, this guy. He didn't know Paul at all in the writings of Paul. He simply was a professor in a secular college telling us what he thought, and he was wrong. Because how could he say that Paul had no heart when he's the one who God used to write 1 Corinthians 13, an entire chapter on the love of God? 
How could you say that Paul had no heart when, when Paul did all the things that he did? When you look in the scriptures and you look at some of the things that Paul did, you'll see that Paul endured quite a number of things for the sake of the brethren, for the sake of the people. When he was writing, for example, to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 and 28, he was speaking of the things that he had endured for the sake of the gospel. And he said, I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst. I've often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul wasn't just a, a hard-hearted, lacking compassion intellectual. He was a shepherd, and he cared about these people. And these people were always on his mind and in his prayers, like he said to the Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 16, where he said, I haven't stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. So he wants to go. We want to see, he says, how they're doing. But verse 37, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. And Paul insisted that they should not take, uh, that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul told, uh, uh, chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. They went through a, 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 a division of heart over this issue. You remember what had taken place. You see, Paul had already had experience with John Mark. And Paul saw him for what he was at that moment, at that point, that season in his life, if you will. He was an immature believer. And Paul did not agree with taking an immature believer on such a, uh, an important uh, journey. When we were looking in chapter 13, we saw how that Mark had gone as an assistant to them, but he had left. He had gone home. So Paul couldn't rely on Mark. Why? Because he's unreliable. He showed himself unworthy of such an important task. You see, the Spirit had sent them to offer salvation to the Gentiles, but, but Barnabas had departed. It, it says in verse 38 here, Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed. That word departed is a very strong word in the original language, which is Greek. Uh, the, the word actually speaks of desertion. It, it speaks of the, him abandoning. He left, he departed, he deserted. And Paul couldn't count on him. So Paul said, no, I'm not going to take him. When it says in verse 39, the contention became so sharp that they parted, the word contention means a, a provocation. It was such a sharp irritation. Now, they didn't have a carnal fight, if you will. They were both strong in their beliefs. Paul said, no, he's not ready. And Barnabas said, but I can encourage him to become. I'm willing to work with him. Somebody said John Mark had been tried in difficult circumstances and failed. Paul, therefore, would not trust him again. The affection of Barnabas led him to hope for the best and wanted to give him another chance. Barnabas would not give up. Paul would not agree. They therefore agreed to separate and take different parts of the work. Each had a companion to work with. Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul took Silas and he went into Syria. Verse 40 says that Paul chose Silas. Now, Silas is... We've already been introduced to him. He's a, he's a proven believer. He's a prophet. He strengthens believers. And so what they do in verse 41 is they go through Syria and Cilicia, and they're strengthening the churches. So instead of a single team, they now have two teams that have been formed. When you think about this, and I'll take a moment to share some things with you that may be practical and hopefully understandable. When you see sometimes an opportunity is given for you to go somewhere and to do something from the, for the Lord, you may think at first, that sounds exciting. It sounds like something I'd like to do. I want to be part of that. And, and part of the problem of that can be is that because of the lack of experience in that kind of thing, we may have a way of viewing it that really isn't consistent to what it really actually is. When I started teaching Bible back in 1973, 
when I began teaching a Bible study, I thought it's very simple. You just open up the book and you talk about God. How hard is that? Well, it can be a little difficult. I remember a woman who approached me one time after a Bible study. I was like 25 years old at the time, 26, somewhere in that area. I forget how old I was, but I do remember what she said. She said, I hate you. And I said, Marie, you can tell me that at home. Why are you telling me I hear? You're embarrassing me in front of people. No, it was a woman in the Bible study. And she walks up to me after the study. And she says, I just need to let you know I hate you. I said, okay. What are you supposed to say? I said, okay. And she says, well, wait, I'm not through. Oh, gee, thanks. You got more. Okay. Um, she says, I don't know if it's because I hate authority or I'm physically attracted to you. And I said, you hate authority. There's no doubt in my mind that you hate authority. See, these are things you don't expect. You think you're going to open up the book, you're going to talk about God, people are going to love Jesus, they're going to follow Christ. That's what you think. But there are so many people and so many things and so many experiences you have that it begins to awaken you to the fact that this isn't as easy as it appears. You know, the number one thing that people don't like to do, number one thing, all surveys I've ever seen, the number one thing that people do not like to do is they don't like to speak in front of people. Number one thing. Second thing <clears throat> for me is they don't like to study. And look what God did. I don't like to speak in front of people and I didn't like to study. So he said, here, I'm going to put you there. So I'm going to force you to do those things. But you're not ready for that. You're not saying, I want to do that. I volunteer for that. It's a calling that God gives to you. Many years ago, and I want to develop this further with you about him not being ready because I see him as a man who wasn't ready for ministry. Many years ago, we were given an opportunity. I was given an opportunity to go to, to India to minister. And I was, uh, the church was young at that time. And so was I physically. I've been doing ministry for a while, but it was the first time I'd ever have a chance to go to India. And I remember the traveling. The travel to get to India was very, it was long. We had several stopovers. It took us quite a number of hours to finally arrive. And when we finally arrived at Bombay, when we finally arrived, I still remember as we arrived, we were just dead. I mean, we spent five hours in Frankfurt for a layover. And by the time you get there, you're already dead tired. And as we were walking and gone through customs and walking to, uh, to the gates to exit, I'm noticing a double, double pane glass. There's double pane glass all through the uh, airport exit as you're going out. And I discovered why there was double pane glass when we got out because I had never been around the stench of, of rotting and decay in, in such a magnitude in my life as, as I experienced there just arriving in the airport. I could not believe how, how, how much you could smell the putrefaction, the decay all through. And they double paned so you couldn't smell it when you got to the airport. But once you stepped out, and then we're driving, and as we're driving, we stop, by a, uh, we stop at a stoplight. We're on our way to the hotel we're going to be staying at. And every island, every traffic island that we stopped at had, had people living there in cardboard structures. That's where they lived. And then we get to the hotel, and when we get to the hotel, I look outside, and there in front of me is a body of uh, water similar to a lake, if you will, small lake. On one hand, I see someone washing the clothes, and another, another, I see someone bathing their child, and in the third, and all of this is within 100 yards, there's someone drawing water out to go and cook with. That was my introduction. And as we, I was there 16 days, and so we started seeing a lot of things. We saw, started seeing many things that were very difficult. There was, there's a smell of decay. There's a poverty that's everywhere. It's beyond you. I'd never seen poverty like that in my life. You know, little children, uh, I'm talking about six, seven, eight-year-old kids, had been basically purchased or given to what we would today call pimps. That's what they're called, basically. And they would take a, 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 a club and broke their leg or arm and, and so that the child's arm would, would heal in, in, in a crooked way. The leg, they couldn't walk. And they would have them beg. And everything they got from the tourists, they were to give to the guy who was handling them, the pimp. And I saw that. I saw a woman who was on the side of the road taking uh, small uh, uh, 
stones and break it into gravel. And, and, and as we're going, the, the guy I was with, who was the, uh, the, the guide, if you will, said, you know what she's doing? She's breaking those large rocks into gravel. She sells the gravel. She works in the sun 10 hours a day for 50 cents a day so she can pay for that, pay for food to pay for food for her children. And we're seeing that and seeing that and seeing that. I go to a, we stop in a, a place on, on the side of the road so we could grab something to eat. And, and I walk into this. It's a small cafe and I walk into it and it's got concrete floors. It's in some village outside uh, where we were staying in. And, and I could see the pathway of human feet because they weren't wearing shoes. They're just barefoot. I could see the pathway on the concrete. I had to go to the bathroom and go, to the, go around to the bathroom. And the door of the, of the, bath, of the, of the toilet area there is just, it does, it's not on its hinges. You have to pick it up and move it to go in. And it has foot pads there and, uh, and uh, just a hole there that you use for, for uh, relieving yourself. And, and uh, human beings had had been there, and, and there was, I don't want to be overly descriptive, but they, they were not very accurate in, in, I'll put it that way. So there's all this feces all over. And you could see the footpath as it walks out into the kitchen. And as I'm walking, following that footpath out, I see the, 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 the cook who's got a, a knife he's sharpening on the door stoop. And you could see that that's where people had traveled, bringing human feces into the kitchen, and he's sharpening his knife on the door stoop that's infected with human waste. And so we drive, and, and, I, and I'm talking on a, on a recorder, trying to remember all the things that I'm seeing, and I said, well, we're going by a lake, and then I start to dry heave. Why? Because it wasn't a lake. It was a lake of sewage, a lake of sewage. One thing after another, after another, after another, we couldn't eat the food there because one of the people who ate food in, in, in a restaurant had gotten something that infected him and he had to go home and he got home. When he got home, he almost died. He was a medical miracle because he had taken some medicines they gave to him that had sulfur and arsenic in it. And we, we went through so many things by the time I had gotten to the the east, uh, one of the eastern cities, Madras, this, we're there. I was through. I said, that's it. I called Maria and I said, I got to come home because I saw a little girl. I estimated her to be between three years old or so, maybe four at the maximum, without any clothes, laying on cardboard on a sidewalk with her mother begging for money to feed her child. And I happen to have a sensitivity to little children. It breaks my heart to see them like that, and I couldn't take it anymore. I called Marie. I said, I got to get out of here. I can't take this anymore. I just can't. And I s wept on the phone. We were in a city that had what they called women in, women in cages, where women who were prostitutes were kept in cages, actual cages, some of them with their children that they'd given birth to through their prostitution. The poverty, the stench, we, we, we couldn't eat. We had anything, we, we ate whatever you could peel, which was boiled eggs or oranges or banana. We wouldn't drink the water, so you had to be given bottled water that was mineral water, and we were told, have them open it so you can hear the sound of the water, and the, you can see that it's actual mineral water because if you drink the other water they offer you, you're going to get sick. See, so I have, I didn't come home, by the way, but I, I wanted to. And I'd been in ministry a long time by that time. So when I, when I read about this young man, John Mark, that he just couldn't handle it, I relate. He was in a different land. He was doing different things. He, just, he wasn't ready. Paul said, no, I need, I need uh, somebody in the Delta, you know, and this guy's just a recruit. I need somebody who's a Delta Force person who, who knows what missions and ministry is. And this is a person I have to teach every step of the way. I'm not going to do it. But Barnabas is saying, no, I will. I'll take him. I am the son of encouragement. That's what Barnabas means, son of encouragement. I will take him. I will help him. I will minister to him. You don't have to worry about him. Paul says, no, I'm not going to do it. I'll take Silas. And Barnabas took with him his cousin, John Mark. And if that's the only place that we have to see these people, then, then we would say, my goodness, that's a terrible story. But that's not true. It, we have other places. We know that under the encouragement of Barnabas, that, that Mark became a strong servant in the Lord. 
it became, uh, it's obvious in scripture, he became very close to the apostle Peter. Peter mentions him, but not only that. The gospel of Mark has been called by theologians a gospel that was given to him, dictated to him by the apostle Peter. And there are those who would speak concerning the gospel of Mark. They see in reality it's more than likely the gospel according to, to Peter. He was very close to the apostle Peter. If all, if all we had was what we're seeing here and what we've seen before and, and maybe the mention that the apostle Peter makes of him, we might say, I wonder whatever happened to him. But when we read Paul's last letter, 2 Timothy, and I want you to remember that this is a man who traveled, and we're seeing it here in the book of Acts, this is a man who is willing to go anywhere to die for the gospel of Jesus Christ who ended up in jail and beheaded on the side of the road outside of Rome. This is a man who is willing to go anywhere to give up his life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He loved people. He wept for people. He ministered to people. Day and night, he prayed for people. But when you read in 2 Timothy, his last letter that he writes, he says to them, I've been abandoned by everybody. And he's writing to Timothy, he's saying, make, make haste to come and see me. Bring the parchments and bring me something to wear. I, I need something to cover me because the cell that I'm in is so cold. And he says, everybody in Asia has Abandon me. In ministry, I don't expect everybody to remain. No minister should. In the case of Paul, he said, I've been abandoned by everybody. But he went on to say in 2 Timothy 4.11, only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me. The last word we hear of Mark is he became profitable. So we don't give up on people because they didn't have what it takes at that moment. We want to be encouragers to those who've stepped out in faith and perhaps were not as successful as we would like them to have been. Barnabas said, no, I'm going to encourage him. Thank God for the Barnabases in our lives. Thank God for the people who said, I believe in you. I believe that God will do something through you. God hasn't given up on you, and I won't either. Thank God for friends like that. And that's what basically took place here. Barnabas took Mark. He sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Which brings us to chapter 16. Just one last reminder, it's not how you begin, but how you finish that counts. In verse 1, he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium, Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. And so we're now introduced formally to a young man that we all know because First and Second Timothy, he's mentioned those are letters to him and all, but we're being introduced to Timothy. Now, around eight years before, Paul had preached in an area called Lystra. We've seen how he had preached in that area. He preached in a city named Iconium, and, and Paul and Barnabas had stayed there for a long time. They were preaching there in the synagogue, and that many people were listening, but it was... Uh, it was uh, so disturbing to them that, that there was trouble that started because unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and began to poison their minds against the Apostle Paul and the gospel. In chapter 14, verses 5 and 6 of the book of Acts, it says, A violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them. Uh, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lycaonia and the surrounding region. And so we've already been partially introduced in some of the things that led up to this. 
this Timothy's grandmother and uh, his mother were Jews. And they were uh, women who had trusted in Christ as their Messiah. And so Timothy, his grandmother and mother, had come to faith under Paul's ministry. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, Paul said to him, I, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded, now lives in you also. So through Paul's ministry, Timothy had come to faith in Christ. And when he did, Paul regarded him as his true son, his genuine son in the faith. There are two men in the New Testament that Paul calls my son in the faith. One of them is Timothy and the other is Titus. And he calls him my genuine son, my true son. Now, as I mentioned, his grandmother and mother were Jews, but his father was Greek. That's another way of saying that his father was not a believer. So that makes him an unusual man, this Greek man who's Timothy's father. He wasn't a believer, but he was gracious to his wife. Now, why would that be a big deal now in the 21st century? Shouldn't he be? Well, Greek husbands had a stranglehold on the life of their wives. Somebody wrote a respectable Greek woman led a totally secluded life. She never appeared in public alone. She never appeared at meals or social occasions. She had her own apartments, and none but her husband was ever allowed to enter in. There was a Greek writer, Xenophon, who said, the purpose of this isolation is in order that she might see as little as possible, hear as little as possible, and ask as little as possible. So this man must have been a benevolent man because he didn't hinder her from following her faith. That isn't always the case, but it was very good when it happened. So that meant that Timothy's mother was free to lay down scriptural foundations for him. And by laying down those scriptural foundations, it made it more possible for him to come to faith in the God he'd been taught about by his Jewish mother and grandmother. I believe it's a very important thing for us as parents, by the way, those of us who are, and even grandparents, for us to nurture our children in the faith. And it's not easy. I won't pretend that it is, and it wasn't when my kids were small. Just because they were born to a pastor and, a, and, and a, a, a godly woman doesn't mean that they didn't have a sin nature. They had a sin nature they got from their mom, and it was very difficult. <laughs> so, I would, so I would give them devotions from the time they were very small, from the time they were little. Every night, five days out of the week, they got devotions, and two nights out of the week, Two days out of the week, they were in church. They came to church on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights as well as Sunday. My children were saturated for seven days a week, all of their childhood. And they still gave us a run for our money. So what's going to happen when we ignore and never do any of that? If we're not teaching them about God and what God is, somebody else is going to teach them what God isn't. We have to be aware of that. Timothy's mom was married to an unbelieving Greek. But benevolence, God was gracious in this case because she was able to teach him scripture. Paul speaks about that in 2 Timothy when he says in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 3, he said to him, you, you must continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of knowing from whom you've learned them and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So he had been prepared. The fundamentals had been laid in his heart. He had done what the Jewish kids of his day would have done. He memorized chapters of the Bible, books of the Bible. They would memorize the first five books. He knew the Word of God. He was taught the Word of God. So when he heard the gospel and how it's completed through Christ, he was able to embrace Christ in faith. It's interesting, uh, another thing to point out, I, point out, I want you to notice in verse 2 how it says he was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and, I, and at, at Iconium. He was well spoken of. He had a great reputation. That's one of the things, again, that a minister ought to have. Paul wants to take this young man because he is well knowledge, has great knowledge in Scripture and a good reputation. My father taught me many things, but he didn't sit me down and lecture me. 
I don't know what your dad was with you, whether you even had the, the blessing of a father. I don't know. I can say in my case, my father didn't talk. My father was very quiet, so I had to learn my father and his ways by observation. But on occasion, he would speak to me and say something. And one of the things my father said to me was, you need to have a good reputation, son. A reputation matters. I can still remember my brother and I were young. We were little guys, and I, I might have been seven years old at the oldest. My brother would have been about nine I remember pulling up, it may even have been sooner than that, but we pulled up in front of uh, a house. We, knew, we didn't know who lived there. It was a friend of my dad, and my mom turned around, and I still remember talking to my brother and me, and she said, these people respect your father. Don't you do anything to bring shame to him? Because she knew we didn't want to go. They didn't have any kids to play with. We're going to sit on a couch. We don't want to go. And my brother, had, I had our arms folded like this. We were scowling. We don't want to go here. We were letting her know. And she knew that we were capable of saying something, and so she turned and she said, don't you bring shame to your father's name. Those are the little things that I think of when it speaks about having a good reputation. Because your reputation, in many ways, is what strengthens your testimony of the gospel. When you do what you say. This man, Timothy, had a great reputation. He was well spoken of. Proverbs 22, verse 1 says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. My dad taught us something. Again, this is another thing that I bring into my life, and that was this. And my mom taught us that because, again, my dad didn't tell us. My mom would tell us about my dad. She said, Your dad will pay his bills before he buys groceries, which is true. Your dad will pay his bills before he buys groceries because his name means that much to him. She said, if I have to find some leftovers and scramble them up and give it to you, that's what you're going to eat because, my, because your, your father believes that paying his bills is what gives to him the outer image of character. I'm the same way. I got that from my father. Pay your bills first. Make sure you're paid up. I would rather not owe someone, so I do my best not to, because I want to have a good name. It gives you credibility. And ministers are to have an impe impeccable reputation. You see, the message that he's going to be taking is one that speaks of lives that are changed through God's grace, through love, through forgiveness. And that's why we're to die to our old lives and live the new ones that are empowered by the Spirit of God, transformed by grace and, and informed by the Word of God. And a spiritual, uh, a spiritual leader is to have a life without reproach. 1 Timothy 3, 7 says, An elder must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. And, and so Paul wanted to take him uh, with him. And he took him, and I want you to notice this, he took him and, had, and circumcised him. Now, obviously, Timothy was trustworthy. Paul knew he could be a great assistant. But people knew that his father was Greek. You see, in the Jewish faith, Jewishness is inherited from the mother, not the father. And because his mother was Jewish, he was considered to be Jewish. And so in order for him to be effective in ministering to the Jewish people, the Jews knew his father was Greek. Therefore, he submitted to the uh, circumcision so it wouldn't have a blockage between him ministering to the Jews, the word of God. Now, Paul didn't circumcise him to be a debtor to the law. Paul circumcised him to give him opportunity to preach because it resulted in greater usefulness in ministry. He allowed himself to be circumcised. Timothy was willing to undergo anything necessary to reach people for Christ. In 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, Paul said it like this. He said, though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. 
To the weak, I became as weak that I might win the weak. Then he goes on to say, I've become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake that I may be partaker of it with you. So Timothy was willing to go through whatever pain was necessary so he could go out and preach the gospel. And what did they do? Verses 4 and 5, they deli- delivered the decrees established by James for the council and the council to keep. And the churches are now being strengthened and their faith is growing. And we'll close by looking at verses 6 through 10. When they had gone through Phrygia, the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man from Pomona stood and pleaded with him. (laughs) Macedonia, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So we'll close with these few, these few words. They're traveling along the southern area of Turkey. They're going west. Paul's desire is to go into the world to preach the gospel to every person. That was his passion. Romans fifteen twenty. he said, I've made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. I want to go where his name hasn't been heard. So he wanted to go into this area called Asia. Now, there are those who think that this is speaking of what we today refer to as Asia, China, Japan, but that's not what it's speaking of. What this is speaking of is Asia Minor. Asia Minor is a geographic region located in the southwestern part of Asia. It's it's comprised mostly of modern-day Turkey. That's where he wanted to go. When you read your Bible and you look at the book of Revelation, it speaks about this area by naming names like Ephesus and Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. The seven churches of Revelation are in Asia Minor. So he wants to go there, but the Holy Spirit won't allow him to do that. They're to remain ministering in that region. And so Phrygia is an eastern portion of Turkey, but Galatia is northwest of this place called Phrygia. Now, Paul was especially successful in Galatia. I'll say this briefly because I'm running out of time. I don't think the pastor wants me to talk that long, but I'll ask him. It's okay. All right, so I'll (laughs) say a couple of things and conclude because I found this interesting. Not everybody will, so I'm just going to touch it. Galatia, we hear about Galatia. There's a book of Galatians. I'll look at that with you some detail later on. But when you see... Galatia, when you think of that, it's in Turkey. So what do you think in Turkey? You think in Turkey that uh, because of modern Turkey, it's filled with, uh, with Middle Eastern people. But Galatia was originally was not Middle Eastern people. You might find this interesting. They were what are called the Gauls. The Gauls came out of Europe. The Gauls were a people group in France and Belgium and Switzerland, southern Germany and Austria. They're also referred to as Celts. They were Celtic. And I find that very interesting. Maybe you don't, but I do. Because in the Middle East, there were Europeans who had come in there, and they brought in their traditions and their beliefs. And they became called Galatians because of the name Gaul. Because Gaul, by and large, is a large portion of the French population is Gaul, Galatian. And they came there. Well, Paul was there. And... uh, when he was wanting to minister and all, the scripture says, this is real interesting, that he had an illness. And he, and, uh, and he ended up planting churches in this area. Galatians 4.13 says, you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. So he, that's what gave him the ability to do that. And so the spirit would not, according to verse 7, per, permit them to go. It may be that he spoke through prophets. It may be that there was an internal witness. How the Spirit was forbidding them isn't made uh, clear, but they didn't go. That's because in ministry, the Holy Spirit needs to be in charge. And the way you determine where to go and what to do is you, you pray and you seek his word. You wait on him. And just because you may feel a burden doesn't mean you have a call. There are a lot of people who want to see something happen somewhere, and they may feel called to that, when in fact, 
They're really called to pray because God is going to send somebody else there. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who directs you. Romans 8, 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So they finally arrive in a port city named Troas, Turkey. And I'll close with these verses. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia, help us. After he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. I want you to notice that prior to this, the word they and them had been used because Luke was speaking of others on the trip, but now he includes himself by saying we. Paul, Silas, and Timothy are joined by Luke. Luke is called the physician in Colossians 4.14, and he joined perhaps to go on the trip, but also be there to perhaps care for for Paul. And finally, in verse 10, they concluded that the Lord had called them to preach the gospel. So as a unified group, they agreed that this was of the Lord. They're there to do it. The Spirit is working there. Paul has a vision, but the group goes together because the work will always be unified. And together they board a ship. Together they go to do the work of the Lord. It's always important when possible when you're doing ministry to have somebody working alongside of you. The Lord hasn't called us to go out on our own and to demand people to follow us simply because. Ministry is normally through a team effort. When Jesus sent people out, he sent his men out two by two because they needed to strengthen one another and to be there for one another. And so they went as a team. They were unified. Paul received the vision and all the people knew that this was in agreement. This is what we're to do, but they went together. And I really think that's a sign of a healthy group of people who are willing to do what God says to do, but they do it together under a unified leadership, prayerful through the word of God, waiting on God and doing what God has for them to do. And so we're going to stop here, but I'll pick up and give some more things about this next time we gather uh, and get into the book of Acts.